This is Keyed In with Max and Brent, unlocking the minds of the industry's top real estate professionals. And now, here are your hosts, Max Rabin and Brent Jackson. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Keaton Podcast. I'm Max Raven. And I'm Brent Jackson. So today, I feel awesome about our guest today, by the way. Excited. Really excited. This is Mark Wellborn. He is the editor of Urban Turf, co-founder of Urban Turf. Urban Turf is, for our local listeners, I'm sure you already know, this is one of our most important uh, real estate publications. The most they, important. Like, literally. They give us all the best local real estate news, like immediately updates on what's what developments are happening, stats, everything. And it's sort of like a daily check in for me. I don't know about I mean, you too, I'm sure I'm on there every day. And anytime yeah. I have a client that says, Hey, where do I go to to look up new condo listings or new information about a neighborhood? I'm always like, go, go to Urban Turf. Always go to Urban Turf. Urban Turf. Or I just send them a bunch of links from Urban Turf. Yeah. And it's all there. Exactly. So welcome to the show, Mark. Thanks for coming on. Hey, thanks for having me. So tell us about like the beginnings of how you got into doing this. I mean, first of all, you're from DC. That's important. Yeah, I'm from DC. I grew up in Northwest. I went to school here and then went away for college and moved to New York. And that's kind of where the idea for Urban Turk came from. So yes. Yeah, so by the way, thank you guys for having me on. I've listened to two podcasts that you guys have done and they've been great. Um, so very happy to be here. Yeah. So the, the idea for Urban Turf, I was, um, I moved to New York in 2002 and for about three years, I was working for a law firm, thought I wanted to be a lawyer, but was doing a lot of writing during that time. And then ultimately decided I did not want to pursue law and uh, tried to get into journalism. But it's tough to get into journalism if you have no experience. Um, and so I ultimately decided to go back to graduate school for journalism at Columbia. And about halfway through that school. It's only an 18-month program. About halfway through that, I got a job working for the New York Observer, which is a small weekly paper, kind of best known for two things. One is it's kind of the fictional paper. It's it's the paper that Carrie Bradshaw from Sex and the City wrote her column for. And then it was purchased by our former presidential son-in-law, Jared Kushner. I remember um, reading about this, yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so he bought the paper when he was 26, and I was working there. I worked there for another four months after he bought the paper. At any rate, I'm working there, and I'm writing about real estate in New York, but I remember going to grad school, and I ultimately... I didn't want to do what a lot of people wanted to do, which is go write for the Washington Post or write for the New York Times. I wanted to start my own business, but I didn't really know what that was. So halfway through working, I'd been working at New York Observer for about four months when I met my partner, Will Smith, um, at a barbecue. And we had this idea for coming up with hyper-local real estate sites. And we were both from D.C. and we talked about it for about two hours. And, you know, you have those conversations and you never think they're going to, you know, you're going to hear from the person again. A month later, I got an email and he said, do you guys want to do, do you want to do this? And so I think that was July 2008. We decided to start doing it and got things off the ground about two months later. Were you guys up in New York when you had, when you went to this barbecue? Yeah. So I was, we were, I was living in Brooklyn at the time. He was visiting. He had kind of been a serial entrepreneur since graduating from from college and uh, we were in New York at the time. And then I started Urban Turf and I was in New York for six months, kind of trying to write articles about DC real estate from, you know, 250 miles away. Why DC versus New York City? I mean, to me, New York City is like the epicenter of the world. Yeah. I mean, that's an excellent question. New York was already saturated with a lot of real estate publications. New York and I guess I would say San Francisco were two of the major cities where, you know, sites like Curb, The Real Deal started in New York. Uh, New York Observer had a big, albeit commercial real estate section, New York Times. So we didn't really feel like we could get a uh, uh, foot in the door there. And DC at the time had Washington Post real estate section, and I guess the Washington Business Journal. So we felt like there was an opportunity for us specifically from the residential side of things. Also the market, you know, growing exponentially around. And then, yeah, there's, I guess there was before you guys, there was really nothing else like that. I mean, while you have Washington Business Journal, right, like you were saying, I was trying to think about other sites that are now putting out uh, local real estate news, but it's still really 
you guys are still really the main ones who kind of do it in this way. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why we've been successful is that another site has not come along to kind of do what we do better, I guess. Curbed was here briefly a couple of years. Did Curbed leave? I mean, are they gone now? Because I don't. I they actually that. were purchased by right. New York Magazine. Okay. And then I, from my understanding, they now just have a New York site. Okay. But yeah, I mean, we felt like there was, if we could, you know, produce a lot of content, that there was an opportunity, you know, particularly from the development side of things, which I would say is at least 50% of our content. Right. And then, we, you know, we were doing neighborhood profiles and kind of highlighting individual homes, which became extremely popular. So just in terms of the journalistic aspect of it from starting from like zero in this a city to do this kind of news how did you start building the relationships to 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 get these scoops and make sure you had this stuff on in a timely manner yeah i mean i think um when we started out we were publishing three articles a week and now we're publishing 20 articles a week and we realized within the first four months that we weren't getting the eyeballs with three articles a week, nor were we getting any interest from potential advertisers. So what we started doing is essentially just trying to reach out to as many people as we could in the development world. You know, a lot of cold emails, just introducing ourselves and saying, here's what we want to do. And I can't remember the first major scoop that we got, but our first advertiser was, and mind you, this is in 2008 when you know, we launched in July 2008. The bottom fell out right. in September 2008. Right. And then we didn't have an advertiser for another three months after that. But City Vista Condos at 5th oh, and yeah. K, yes. the developer from that low needed to sell like, I don't know, like 80 units yeah. or something. And so they were like, let's just take a flyer on this. And I can't remember. I think it was the Mayhood company who was selling them. So they reached out to us and we started doing you know, kind of banner ads for them. And, and then that just begat another and another and another. And then that was kind of. It's interesting, too, because when I think of 2008, I, I, it's like conceptually for the Internet, it's it's not even close to the Internet of today. Right? Oh, no. It's no. like it's still pretty fledgling. right? Well, yeah. And it's interesting to look back on that because like we're still a daily newsletter. That's our primary, you know, avenue to get to our readers. Mm -hmm. And back then, you know, newsletters were kind of novel and now they kind of seem, you, you know, have that newsletter. yeah, exactly. So do you remember your first couple of articles that came out? Yeah, we were doing like, uh, gosh, and it's just like looking back on, you know, when you were in kindergarten or something, but it was, we were doing articles like five things you need to know about buying a home in DC. Okay. Like, you know, and we were doing it's kind of like us trying to start a podcast. It's exactly. like, what are we going to do? Right. Five things to start. <laughs> and I'm not right. right. Yeah. And I'm not saying that article isn't useful today. It obviously is. But we feel like the we thought we were being really innovative and being like, this information isn't out there. Right. Like and now 15 years later, it's everywhere. Right. Like you type that in. We were doing a couple of neighborhood profiles. I think we started doing the. You know, we pick a price point and we say, what, $550,000 buys you? So I think we were doing that and those were hugely popular because, mind you, this is also before like the automated Zillow's and, right, right. you know, when MLS's were kind of, you know, they weren't online. So people were, you know, or at least they were just coming online. So we felt like we were offering, you know, service of sorts for that. So in the early days, were you writing some of these articles as well? Or you had a writer? Yeah. So I was writing, I mean, at the be at the early days, it was me and Will. And actually, we had a, a minority partner named Rocky Vega. And he left after about a year. But it was, I was doing all the writing. And Will was doing all the, you know, groundwork to find us um, advertisers and kind of dealing with like the, any technical issues that came up with the site. So should be noted, so your wife is a realtor with Compass. Yes. And so how does, I mean, what, I was going to ask you about like how you find out things that you need, that you want to write about and like what your sources are. So how does having your wife in real estate like help or affect the, the way that you operate? 
Well, I really try and make sure that there's no, it doesn't look like there's any influence or favoritism happening. Yes, yeah, just to, to clarify, yeah. like, like, like I'm not, what I'm not trying to say is like, it's like, it's not her, it's not her like secret advertising website <laughs> right. that has all this yeah. amazing journalistic content. She gets I, all the leads I, on the back. I, I must <laughs> note that it, it, it feels, I mean, it feels, and it is like a very, pure journalistic sure. thing where and obviously you sell ads and everything yes. you know that's the uh, right it's a website but no i'm just you know just curious because like you're looking for scoops you're looking for new information she's obviously a successful realtor yeah so i mean that's what i'm just sure i mean i think that things will happen like i'll want to know close price for a listing or something like that right and i'll say can you look this up for me but now that and that was about three years ago i would ask questions like that but now again that, that question is everywhere yeah so i think it's more honestly what happens now with pam is that i'll write an article and it'll be like 10 30 at night and I'll have read it three times or I'll have edited an article and I'll be like, can you read this right quick? Sure. But that's kind of the extent of things. And it's interesting because it's not a reciprocal relationship in terms of I really try and keep urban turf business just to myself. Yeah. Pam will come home and it's 30 minutes about this deal and 10 minutes right. about this deal. Right. <laughs> we, love, we love talking about that. We love I talking. mean, the last time Pam and I went out to dinner, she had to bring her laptop and like put it underneath her chair because there was some and contract you guys thing. know yeah, yeah. as well as anybody there was some you know contract that might done. needed to be ratified within like a 45 minute window or something it's so it's it's, it's both like part of the business but it's also just so embarrassing you're like i literally have had this like dinner or or show or tr or vacation planned for months and then you get there and you're on the phone like just it's that's the life of a realtor i guess right? exactly so. i mean i think vacation is a little bit of a you know misnomer misnomer for you guys yeah so how big is the urban turf team right now so we have will and i and then we have a tech guy who works on a freelance basis and then nina perry brown who has been writing who had been writing for us for six years she just moved on to another chapter in her career actually last week. So we're in the process of finding a new like main writer. And then we have a couple of freelancers. And then we have a director of operations, Mariah Burke Reigns, another local yep. um, na DC native who handles everything from like sales to uh, various administrative stuff. She kind of takes care of everything for us. So not obviously, you know, being in journalism, you're not looking at revealing your sources. But I mean, you guys, again, I was just mentioning to you before we started recording that I'm going to record something else after this. And it's going to be down at the wharf. It's sort of like highlighting the wharf. And as I'm like flipping through Instagram, I see you have a new post about all the new stuff that's about to be. I mean, it's either out of the ground or coming to the wharf, but it's in such detail. Yeah. So how do you. I mean, you must compile this information constantly. That's what must be like the core of your business. Yeah. I mean, Nina was excellent, is excellent at compiling that stuff about developments. We have, and then we have a lot of developer contacts that we just reach out to if we want to, excuse me, fact check it. Um, we have some automated alerts that are set up through the Historic Preservation Office, through DC zoning, through Arlington County's permit database that kind of alert us when a new development is filed. And then as far as individual properties, like, you know, our audience loves if, you know, $30 million house in McLean hits the market sure. or, uh, you know, like, you know, a huge house in Calorama hits the market. So we have a certain threshold for getting a uh, alert that, you know, tell will tell us when a nine plus million house hits the market. And then we kind of go through covering that. But aside from that, it's, you know, we get a lot of people emailing us being like, have you heard about this? And then we kind of just dig into it. So I think I would say it's a variety of things. Yeah. So when you're first starting out, going back to the early days, how are you getting urban turf and urban turf out to the consumer? Like, are you guys advertising on other websites or how, how is the consumer getting to you? We had a relationship with a company called DCLofts.com and he had bought the domain name and essentially put a bunch of new condo developments in it. And so it was kind of a place, again, really early days of that type of thing where people could just go and look and see new condo developments. And we said, you know, would you be up for having some type of reciprocal relationship whereby 
you know, you kind of promote us and then we'll, are you feature some of our articles and we'll give you a little free advertising. And it was various things like that, that, you know, kind of started getting the word out there. But I would say that it wasn't until we started publishing five days a week. And, you know, I think it, once our newsletter, our subscribers hit 5,000, which took at least a year, then it started really taking off after that. I think it was a lot of word of mouth. That's a lot of subscribers in one year. That's what I was going to say. It's pretty good growth. Yes. Yeah. I think that those were just really the, I, I think we, again, really benefited from there not being really another thing like us like washington post real estate section that came out on sunday yeah washington business journal they weren't doing a ton of residential stuff at that time and then there wasn't really anything else yeah like i said it's and it's still that's pretty much still the way it is right now i mean yeah it's not, occasionally i'll look at the uh, business journal in their uh, residential section but it's it's limited it's right. not and it's not as it's it's the, i mean there's news there but it's not quite what i'm hoping for no it's usually you know. you're looking at the, the whatever the back page is to see maybe some of those off-market deals that we never saw sure in the exactly MLS, like what traded into who and for how much yeah uh, that's the only reason why i go to the business journal so it's like you have your own little monopoly there right you're able to play with i would say washingtonian also sorry has a i like their real estate section a lot i think it's the like edgiest thing that a traditional publication is doing in dc and then city paper had housing complex but again that was a different that was a different kind of that's uh, I, i'm vibe. really glad you brought that up that is another these are the things of dc people like us like the things of our past mm -hmm. right i mean the city paper still exists it's different now but yeah housing complex and of course everything else about the city paper that was those were my that was one of my main go-to things oh absolutely i and, mean the know. city paper used to be what i picked up in high school Every Thursday. Every Thursday. Yeah. Yeah. Well, explain the city paper for someone that's not a D.C. native here. City paper was a local publication, a weekly publication, mainly, I'm sure you the same way. I went on there to check out the concert. Absolutely. Like 100 percent had to see who's coming to the 930 Club yeah. or Black Cat or whatever. Mm -hmm. And when were tickets going on sale for like ACDC at the, you know, Mary US Air yeah. or whatever. And so... um. And then in there, there was a, a column called Housing Complex, and Housing Complex was more related to, I guess, it had a political sort of angle to it mm -hmm. in, in a lot of cases. But during the course of this era that we're discussing, let's just say like from maybe the early 2000s to sort of where we are now in this market is like 2011 on, all of that kind of stuff was uh, extremely important. The discussion of topics like gentrification, topics of, of zoning and permitting. But the way that the way it was written was there was a lot of news there and they've covered some stuff really well in depth. Yep. But the the market and the world has expanded so much in the city now. And plus the city papers sort of was going out of business and they needed to revamp and it was purchased by Mark Hine. Mark so, Hine right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So anyway, but yeah, that was just like a little there you go. There's a there's a tangent for our I've got another you know, listeners. Not, <laughs> exactly. a, not a tangent, but just a curious question. You used to go down to the metro and they'd give you those free papers. Are those still around? That's, that was the Express, right? The, yeah, the Express. Yeah, that's, that's gone too, I that's think. That's gone. Yeah. I mean, I just remember City Paper was at any local establishment that you went to. Right. It had like a little crate there. And you and picked they're it free. Up. Yeah. 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 And but, Capitol Hill has one. They have Hill Rag. Exactly. Sure. And that's still around, I that's think. That's still around. Yeah. Yeah, City Paper, man. That's I've been, been, Max is absolutely right, though. That was like the concert flyer, like... If you wanted to find out who was coming over the next two months, that's where you went. And it was it's crazy. Now, obviously, you go online. But back then, I remember going, I was like, I want to go to this. I want to go to this. I want to go to this. Yep. Have you guys ever thought about doing a publication as far as like a, a hard copy of something? I think we considered doing something that kind of was like a new condo directory that would be more of an advertising product. But then the cost of doing so that. Expensive compared to the value you would get out of it we didn't really yeah. see that it was that's there. where you hit us agents up it's like the phone book it's like hey we're going to do this fancy book and it's going to cost you five thousand dollars <laughs> to be on the front of the magazine of the book right exactly <laughs> well i you know in general though that's that's journalism now anyway like i, I 
I'm always wondering at what point Washington Post, New York Times, like the the paper ends because it doesn't. We keep paying them money to like say how great we are as agents. <laughs> well, what I'm saying is um, like literally the actual publication, the paper itself in circulation because it's expensive. It's there's transportation costs. There's all kinds of resources that go into that. I mean, how many people are still getting these like written I publications? Am. You still get a. Written... I read the New York Times every morning. I I get to the gym five five thirty and I'll sit there. I don't have a high intensity workout like you, you and Peloton. I'm just picturing you in the locker room, <laughs> yeah. just like sitting back, like in your underwear, with yeah. like the New York Times on the couch. Like, yeah, I went to the gym today. Good morning, Brent. <laughs> you know, like that's that's yes, it right there. That's me. Well, can I ask you guys a question? Like, I mean, Washingtonian comes to mind as one place that just seems like a required ad buy for you guys. They kind of push it that way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but I think there's real value for that. I mean, I know that. At a certain age demographic, you know, people are still at home getting the Washingtonian, mm -hmm. reading it, flipping through it. And so to be visible in there, it seems like it's it's a worthwhile money spend. We do. I think we, we advertise in a couple of different glossy magazines. The one that we always struggle with, I think it's the Washingtonian best of. Yeah. And I'm assuming like it's like, like how that much, across the how board. Much it's, like, oh, it's like ten thousand dollars, you can be the best agent. I'm like, you know, then there's fifty yeah. of our top competitors in there. And then yeah. the ones that didn't get in there, they explain on social media why they didn't get in there. They didn't pay for the ad. They have something else coming out. I mean, it's a whole yeah. uh game. We discuss it every single year. It's like they hit us up for the money and like do we just do we do it? Do we not do it? If we're not in it, people don't think we're successful. It's like it's But then but it it is true. I, I think that it, maybe at some point, um, all of the brokers will collude and say, we're done with this, you know, because we're forking out. I don't even know how much Compass forks out for, for oh, their for that spread. That's that's a nice that spread, spread. The have. first time they did that spread for our listeners, this is a couple of years ago. Compass did a spread that was probably 50 pages in the in the Washingtonian. And the it was really well done, too. It was very personal. And the photographs of the agents were like doing things that were sort of candid. It wasn't the typical like you know, headshot. Mm -hmm. Right. So and after that, I think that everyone else is like, oh, we need to step up our Washingtonian game for the best of. And it's just and then the Washingtonian's like, yes, you <laughs> right, know, right. But that's fine. It's fine. Like, I'm just saying, like, it's a lot of advertising dollars that go in that direction. That's true. Yeah. I mean, the whole goal, right, is that you want to be reading the magazine and then you want to be reading something. And before you know it, you're reading an ad, but you don't realize it. Right. Of course. So I just feel like that's probably what Compass was thinking the entire time, right? Absolutely. It's ad advertorial. Advertorial. Yeah. That's what I, was, I was trying to think of the, the term. It's advertorial. We know that term very well. Yep. So urban turf, when I think of urban turf, I think of it as being, it's, it's pretty straightforward. I can go to urban turf, the daily article or the links um, that you guys post, which is also extremely helpful. It's another thing that important to point out. That's one of your, your products there is that you consolidate other links from other publications. So again, it's a sort of one-stop shop if you're a DC realtor to, to or gather. Or consumer. I mean, it's yeah, or a consumer, consumer to gather real estate news. But uh, so in, in this age of like, you know, obviously media has expanded to beyond essential journalism stuff, beyond news media, and everything is sort of heading in this direction of Instagram, TikTok being more viral. What what do you see as a, like the future of urban turf in, in with regards to any of those kinds of things? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, we use Twitter a lot. We use Instagram more and more these days. TikTok is one of those things, Max, as you well know, that I personally have a little bit difficult of difficulty figuring out how urban turf would play into that it's so much i mean i can already think of how it would work but go ahead Just well it's but well, there's so much video that it, like tiktok is video and our our platform is currently zero video so i think we would have to figure out how that would work i think that we would like to try and increase the frequency of what we're you know we do about four articles a day including that link roundup right. and i think that if we could increase our frequency i think that would bring more eyeballs but the world of social media is one that you know a new something new comes along you know every couple of years and publications like mine try and figure out how to how to how to utilize it and i think we have figured that, that out with twitter and instagram but so much but not necessarily with with tiktok but just more to your your question you know i think that local media is tough media in general is tough local yeah. media is tough and i think that right now we have something good going so i think that for now we're just going to kind of you know keeping on keeping on right 
So yeah, you mentioned the idea of doing something like this in New York, but the, before you started here, that it was a saturated market and you're like, I don't know how we get our foot in the door, but any thoughts about like expanding to other, I mean, look, the real estate market's changed a lot too in the, in recent years and even the last couple of years, like some of our secondary quote unquote, secondary markets have gotten really popular. Sure. And, um, obviously I'm sure there's other things going on in those cities that I have no idea about, but have you ever thought about like shifting to other some of these other smaller markets that. Well, yeah, the pandemic, it makes that interesting because as you pointed out, New York, San Francisco, DC are not necessarily the only destinations for say young grads anymore. So the idea of going to like, you know, a Charlotte or an Austin or like Richmond, Richmond, Virginia. exactly. Yeah. But, you know, Urban Turf kind of needs like a special combination of things in order to move to a new mar market. You have to have, you know, there there doesn't there shouldn't be really anything else like us there. You know, you have to have a new a pretty sh thriving new construction industry because that's where a lot of our advertising dollars come from. So I think it's something right. we would consider. We attempted to go to Chicago back in 2000. 12 and we realized that the amount of work that we put into urban turf dc we would have to put in that same amount in chicago and every to you know build that. every market going forward yeah yeah so obviously you know you are getting all this information about what's happening the newest locations or you're if you've got alerts set for permitting and zoning and all of these things you're getting you're probably getting an early read right on some things how how have you been involved in any development yourself or like have you used this this knowledge as power in the in insider your knowledge business? yeah i mean the short answer is no and i really just always thought that i should you know from a journalistic perspective i was like let's just stay on the journalism front but if i were to just toss out the ethical aspect of like the things i really should have got in the door back in 2009. I mean, there was so much yeah. going on. Cass Riegler, who was the, the local developer, and I'm friends with them outside of it. I remember having a meeting with them in 2010, and we were sitting on 14th Street at the Bus Boys and Poets, and they were like, everything east of here is really going to take off. And, and I was like, like oh, okay. huh, okay. And of course it did. But yeah, I mean, the short answer is no. I mean, we, outside of like some small real estate investments through my, you know, through Pam and I, that's, we, we haven't gotten into the development world. It's, it's very interesting because our first project was, I think, 2010 with Kevin and Adam. Oh, really? Uh, we sold their, I can't remember the address. It was uh, the- On the, Harvard? On Harvard Street. We knocked it out of the park, but those two guys, they're genius. And, and they still have a footprint on some of the stuff they're trying to accomplish and acquire throughout the DMV, but it, it's impressive. It is, Who's yeah. Kev Kevin, Kevin Riegler came from, he's a local guy too. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, he came, he was under Monty Hoffman for a while, so gotcha. he has that that mindset. And Adam Stiefel is from, I think it's Adam Stiefel. Adam Stiefel's from Bethesda, from or Bethesda. I think he's from Montgomery County. Yeah, those guys were great. And I mean, Kevin, like both of them were just really gung-ho about you know, breaking off from the developers they it were is. working with to start their own thing. And several people did that after the afterwards, but they, I really felt like they were two of the guys that did that first. Interesting. Well, I would say like, I, I understand what you're saying and I feel your pain. Brent's been way better at this. Brent, Brent knows I've how to buy and lucky. sell some real estate. Yeah, I've been lucky because we have places in New York, Florida, West Virginia, and it is a lot about luck. So we sold, we bought in West Virginia and at a you know, the Greenbrier. Mm -hmm. We bought at the bottom in the market and the secondary markets across the country are yeah. just on fire right now. So yeah. we sold it unexpected. in January, got good money. We bought in 2008 a few places down in South Florida, down in Miami, foreclosures. We did extremely well down there and a couple of places up in Manhattan. So it's just, it's a lot of luck. Just yeah. buying smart. Yeah. I mean, we had, we own our condo on Logan. I live up in Upper Northwest now, but we own our condo on our street now. And I, I think that that's just the like, luckiest I will ever get from a real estate investment. And obviously, you know, it, it's done well, we still own it. But yeah, I mean, again, we should maybe we should have, you know, expanded our portfolio. Are there any discussions like, about selling? Because sometimes me as an agent, I get I get I just want to sell, like I want to buy it and sell like I can't hold on to stuff for too long. So is there any discussions between you and Pam about we should unload Logan and go buy 
somewhere else. All the time. All the time. And they're, they're usually one way, which is Pam saying that, you know, we should sell this because once Pam gets done with the DC real estate market, like eight to 1030 is like looking in Eastern Maryland or looking, uh, just looking for, um, looking for the vacation home. She grew up on the Hill and, uh, her parents have had a series of homes they fixed up in Maryland and now Rhode Island. And so Pam has that, has that bug. They still have a place up in Rhode Island? Yeah, they have a place in a small community about five minutes from the Providence Airport. Oh, wow. Yeah. I have an existential uh, question that might be complicated to answer. So you're, you're from D.C., your wife's from D.C., I am from D.C., and yet we all still live here. Like, do you, do you ever have these moments where you're driving down this? this is, I'm just telling you this because this happens to me all the time now. Okay? Yeah. You're driving down Mass Avenue. You're driving down the street. You're walking down George, in Georgetown, and you're like, how how much longer am I going to be doing this? Oh, I when <laughs> I mean, just for perspective, I grew up in D.C. I went away to Colorado. I moved to New York. I came back to D.C., but then I didn't want to live where I grew up. I'm living now where I grew up. My life has fully come. What is it? 360, 180. Yeah, pulse, yeah, right. um, so I think initially I thought about that. But I have a lot of friends from D.C. that came back here. And I think if you went to high school actually in D.C. proper or did your all your schooling in D.C. proper around the time that we were there, you have a you have a pretty strong bond with those friends and the city. Yeah. Um, so I would say the times that I'm now thinking about the fact that I still live here and I think it's weird. Those those are few and far between compared to when I was back here in 2010. Yeah. Yeah, just I was looking at some photographs of myself in high school, which is always scary anyway. When you see your your younger self, you're like, oh my god. But um, walking down in Georgetown, like after going shopping, totally. and it's from like the mid '90s, mm -hmm. and I'm like, this is this could have been. It's just I don't know. It's bizarre. it's bizarre. Well, and also all these places that are now closing, Commander Salamander closed for a long time. Oh yeah, the Uptown Theater closed. Like I just you know, if you were from this area, yeah, you you know, it hits your heart a little harder. Yeah. And that's just that's the way things are. I mean, if we, had, if we had been here 50 years before that, we would have thought the same thing about any other random exactly. thing that had closed. I know. Yeah. Can you go back and just, is there anything different that you would do? Like starting a business from the ground up just as a business owner, whether you're in real estate or something else, are there any like missteps you could have done something differently? I think we've had, well, me in particular has had a hard time delegating a lot of the editorial work. I think that I would have delegated it more and been less of a micromanager and I still should be but you know I really want to put out a good product and I also think that I would have ramped up the frequency with which we published sooner than you know we were being 18 months into the game and realizing that that was never going to work but by and large like you know I think that we've done a good job we really pride ourselves on making sure that we're the first people out with a story. And if another publication comes along and has already done that story, we kind of decide that we're not going to do it because what we really want Urban Turf to be, and it seems like it is for you guys, is the place to go for your residential real estate news, be it development or properties or et cetera. So I think that, you know, in terms of scoops, in terms of stuff like that, I just, I really pride myself on us making sure that we're the only game in town, so to speak, that has a certain story. You still doing some writing? Yeah, I do probably, out of the 20 articles a week, I probably still do three or so. I like writing about like the really opulent luxury listings. Full disclosure, even though we don't disclose this in the in most of our articles, I really like figuring out who's purchasing these properties that are now selling for 35 million plus in McLean. Yes. Doing that sleuth work. Yeah. I mean, we just had a pretty big story about who has been buying up Chainbridge Road, but and we know we're pretty sure we know who it is, but it took 2 weeks of looking into it. And I was just, I love that. I was fascinated by that. So that would be a story that you would uh, push out to the consumer? Or is yeah. that like too much TMZ? You don't want to be, you know, backlash? <laughs> I mean. It gets eyeballs. Yes. It gets eyeballs. I think people are generally interested, be whether or not you're in the profession or you're a consumer. I think people like knowing about, to put it bluntly, who lives in really big houses in this city and the area. Yeah, I do. 
I mean, not, not that live in a big house, but I'd like to know who lives in a big house. Exactly. Yeah. No, to clarify. Course. Of course. But you know, it's funny. So you were just talking about, you were listening to the episode of Smart List, the, this week's Smart List with yes. David Spade and yeah. talking about celebrity. He was talking about re- meeting with realtors because he wanted to sell his house. And they come over and they're like, we need to, we're going to have to stage this place. And he's like, what are you talking about? There's furniture. You're like, no, we need to like clean, <laughs> we need to clean it up and make it. I mean, real estate's totally different now. And, and then, you know, once it's sold, it's on every like, like the real deal we're talking about all those other different websites and it's it's like it's celebrity news it's it's the hottest thing and then it's real estate related so i mean you got to take part in that his was funny because he also mentioned he took offense because i think the agent told him he's living in a teardown he's like what do you mean yeah tear down? this I'm is sitting definitely on the couch a watching tv he's like no someone's gonna come in here bulldoze your house and build like you know a 50 million dollar house out in la so i mean you know he's very he's very it was, it was funny a, that was a funny one that's great such a great i mean an answer to this podcast, what podcast are you listening to? It was between that and another one. Smart List is so good. And they were just in D.C., right? Yeah, I saw him. Oh, you saw oh, you did? Yeah. Will Ferrell was there. Oh, Will Ferrell that was, was, the, that was their guest. Was that yeah. Oh, my God. So you saw Will Ferrell and all those guys. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel very fortunate that the wow. guest was Will Ferrell because... The, you know, when people come to D.C., it's like, oh, are they going to bring some politician out? Right. Someone I just absolutely don't want to see. And they brought Will Ferrell out. I'm like, oh. They, they went big. Yeah, they Wolf did. Blitzer, come on out. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Exactly, exactly. That's how you expect. I had another quick question. So again, with your ears to the ground on a lot of this development stuff, and I'm also thinking about like, you know, how housing complex used to put their stuff together. Um, we talk to developers a lot and other realtors. And, and one of the things, we, the topics we've been talking about lately is, is how ridiculous it is to deal with a DCRA and zoning in D.C., what I mean, you must hear about all this kind of stuff too. So I just I wonder, like, what are your thoughts on that? Do you have any like, do you have any editorial opinion on that? Because you have a lot of knowledge about like what's going on with permitting and everything. Yeah, to not get too into my own opinion about it. I mean, DCRA has it's well documented that it's been a difficult agency to deal with for years now. Even though they regularly say that they are, you know increase you know improving both the useful the usage of the site as well as the transparency of the agency i mean dc is in this interesting place right because you have the mayor who's putting out this goal of building 36,000 houses by i guess it's 2025 so 3 years from now but then on the flip side of that you have all the agencies and obstacles that you just existed that you know are are hindering developers from from building. So I would say that I hear the same things that you're hearing on a very regular basis. And, you know, it's there's only so much we can write about that because it's like there's only so much you can write about the fact that, you know, there's a low inventory of homes for sale. But we're certainly hearing the same things you are. And I was actually thing that the mayor was at about three weeks ago and at least two people probably who were developers spoke up and said, you know, it's it's getting increasingly difficult to build in this city. Right. And if it stays that way, you know, we're going to go someplace else. Yeah. This is exactly what we were talking about with like Lindsay Reichman. And it's difficult. And a lot of them have gone to not a lot, but I know a handful that's gone down to North Carolina. Yeah. Where land is not an issue and restrictions and historics and things like that are are not in play. Yeah. Well, Mark, we really enjoy your time and thank you so much for coming out here and talking to us and talking about Urban Turf. Again, we uh, really thank you for doing this publication. Obviously, we know it's your business and your livelihood as well, but it is fantastic. And we're on there. That's I mean, that's our that's our resource. I mean, I'm, I'm literally about to go like carry this like article with me to this next recording. And I mean, that's all the information I could possibly need about what's going on at the wharf. And it's like, boom, it's on your website. It's incredible. Awesome. Thank you guys for having me. It's really great. I love the podcast. Thank you very much. So we're going to hit you with some rapid fire questions right now. Rapid five. What is your guilty pleasure? Sports gambling. Sports gambling. I used to do do a lot of that. (laughs) Do you Um, go like Fandle? I go with a less advertised option. (laughs) Okay. So... Let me think about this because that's so this is this is interesting. I used to have this same affliction. We'll just call it that. Right. Because it's a, we'll call it a guilty pleasure. And but it was all before everything was like legal. Right. And and now that it's legal, I don't I'm not going to the sports book or anything. So it's just, just I, do it on the app. 
Yeah. I mean, DC has an app now. I use an app. Yeah, it's I mean, it's everywhere and it's so much more accepted, you know, and, than it used to be. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> like, there's, I mean, it's advertised everywhere you look. Is there because, is there a stadium named after one of the betting sites? I don't know. Exactly, I'm probably. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Crypto.com is the state. Well, it well, used to be former the staple center. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you have a sport that you like to gamble on? Uh, weirdly, golf. Wow. Yeah. It used to be basketball and football, but golf betting has taken off tremendously over the last four years and uh, because you can just get huge odds on it like one golfer we pick like i I do it with my brother and we pick like eight for a tournament and then like you know the payout can be exponentially more if one of those hits it's a whole couple things thing. do you think i'll come back to that but do you think tiger woods will play in the uh masters oh gosh this is so nerdy i <laughs> saw something on twitter yesterday that was called celebrity jets and it showed Tiger's plane landing, landing at Augusta. And the word is that he's going to do a couple practice rounds and see if he can go. I would I would be very surprised if he does not play. I was in I was in I was at the Masters in 2019 when he won um, and it was unbelievable. You um, were at that. I was there. Yeah. Wow. That's like the most to me, it's the most memorable sports event in my lifetime. Yeah, it Watching was incredible. I got it was very, master's tickets are incredibly difficult to get, and I had a friend who had them through his family, so we went. But yeah, golf betting is is what I'm doing now. Gosh, if any of my friends listen to this, <laughs> they're gonna listen. They so. are gonna listen. I'm gonna, gonna, gonna tell them to. I, lo- I love it. Good. Outside of uh, urban turf, what book? What do you like to read? Book, magazine. I just book? finished a book called Anxious People, which is the plot line fittingly is. A bank, a guy robs a bank and then it runs across the street and runs into an open house and he takes all the members of the open house hostage and like all their anxieties, story, I don't know if I this. Yeah. all of their anxieties come out over the course of the book. It's really good. Their Netflix is going to make it into a series apparently, but that was a really good book. Wow. A little scary. Sounds You're like we're doing open houses. Really <laughs> <worst nightmare. laughs> At least I don't think there's any banks that are close by. Uh, favorite vacation spot. Probably Mexico or Italy. All right. Those are good ones. Favorite hobby? I said sports gambling. Do you golf? I I, I started golfing about 18 months ago, and I'm not very good. I I coach my son's baseball team, and as far as that can be a hobby, I really like doing that. Nice. Is he on one of those like teams that travel all around? No, he's well. I used to coach my eight year old's team. Now I'm coaching my five year old's team. So we're really just trying to get the ball to. Just yeah, get out of the t-ball? infield. They moved. Yeah, they changed the rules, so it used to be coach pitch, but now it's back to T-ball. Okay, just trying to get them to run to the right base. Right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Other base, other base. Yeah. yeah. My son played baseball for like one season. Uh, we we kind of we called it quits because he'd be out there like you know chasing a butterfly, totally. Or, you know, kicking dirt, and not even paying yeah. attention. Yeah, so. we we the, we have a bunch of dirt diggers on our team. <laughs> <laughs> so we stuck with tennis, and now he's playing basketball. Um. We always like to ask this question, and you've got some inside knowledge here, but do you have any predictions for the rest of 22? For the housing market? For the housing market. Yeah, I actually am going to probably go against conventional wisdom, and I think inventory is really going to come back about starting around late May. I think that people are going to put their houses on the market thinking they can get a high price, and then that is going to combine with kind of drop in buyer demand when like interest rates hit 5%. You heard it here first. Someone predicted a rise in inventory for 2022. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, we can't. I I also, I really, we can't, we can't put out another newsletter with a headline that there are no homes for sale in D.C. People are going to be like, come on, man. So, no, that's a good point. So you put that headline out and then it'll be like, you know, predictions that housing inventory will rise. It's going to crash. Yeah. And it'll be like urban turf will be on my like Google homepage immediately because. Yeah. That's how it works, man. Yes. I think predictions for the housing market, though, you, you start reading them for like the fall or the spring and you're kind of reading the same thing at r- different publications. So part of me just wants to have a different take. Because it's just a prediction. Right. You know? Yeah. I mean, you can base it on whatever you want and take the data and go either way, pretty much. What does Cowherd say? A prediction sure to go wrong? Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, fully appreciate you coming on here today, taking time out of your schedule to visit with us. And thank you and keep it up and we'll be reading always, man. Awesome. Thank you guys. This was do you great. guys have or do you have a charity of your donation or um, you want to ask that question next time? <laughs> <laughs> we always give a donation to the charity of our guest choice. Oh so, really? Yes. So if you have a charity 
uh main street village end street, street village, village. village yeah are you familiar oh yeah i give yeah. a lot of money to end street yeah love what end street village does so that's where i send the money you awesome. got it we'll thank do you. yeah thank you guys thanks a lot this was great Thanks for listening to Keyed In with your hosts, Max and Brent, unlocking the minds of the industry's top real estate professionals. For more information on selling your home, find us online at keyedinpodcast.com. Remember to subscribe to Keyed In on Apple Podcasts or wherever you like to listen to podcasts. Follow us on Instagram at Keyed In Podcast, at Raven Max, and at Brent E. Jackson. And follow Max on TikTok at Maxwell Rabin underscore properties. Oh, oh, oh.